Hello and welcome to the IA podcast with me, Saeed Kamal, for the latest in our Zero In In series. Don't forget you can subscribe to our podcasts on Apple, Spotify, Podbean, and they're also available on YouTube. And on all these platforms, you can find our recent episodes. Today, we'll be discussing some of the economic considerations around the debate on climate change. Over the last three decades, governments have repeatedly set targets, often for their successors or their successors' successors, which may be missed, but then replaced by more ambitious targets. Now, is this because solving the climate problem requires a restructuring of the energy sector and agriculture, which will take many decades, not just years? And if so, will 2050 be another target that passes us by? Are politicians, many of whom have shared platforms with environmental activists, saying one thing and failing to do another? And what are the free market solutions to climate change and pollution? Will a carbon tax disproportionately hurt the poor? Richard Toll, who joins me today, remotely of course, is a former member of Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth. He has been a convening author with the IPCC and is a professor of economics at Sussex University. Our discussion today covers a number of issues, including coronavirus, challenging environmental orthodoxy, and whether we underestimate human ingenuity in tackling climate change. Why don't we just start with the current so coronavirus and the response to the crisis. You've seen Western governments uh, willing to shut down large parts of their economy, and they're aware of the economic costs. But at least in that comparison, their responses to climate change seem fairly ambitious. Um, when you look at the whole debate around uh, climate change, um, some say it's a crisis, others say it's not as much great a crisis. Um, do you think it warrants a similar ambitious response? And would that mean a drastic reduction in living standards? Um, no, absolutely not. Uh, the, 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 I mean, the two problems are completely incomparable in terms of uh, the timescales. Uh, hopefully this is Corona thing is a short run thing that is measured in months um, and not much longer, whereas climate change is a problem that is measured in decades and centuries. Uh, so in that sense, they're completely uh, incomparable and, and solving the climate problem requires a restructuring of the energy sector and of agriculture. Um, whereas there is hopefully a technical fix for a problem like Corona in, in the form of a vaccine. Uh, so it, it is completely incomparable for, for those uh, reasons. Um, and I know that there's a lot of people out there who, and particularly, of course, in, in the people that I know who typically worry about climate change that are now worried about corona and trying to mix up these two things. And I think it's just silly uh, to do that uh, or to even make a basic comparison. Um, between the two problems. Do you think about some of those organisations that, you know, put themselves at the forefront of the green debate, organisations like Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth? I know you've been a former member of both, both of those. You seem to have sort of deviated from their orthodoxy and you tend to ask critical questions. Now, how do they respond to that? And, you know, and, and how do you respond to their criticism of you? Um, <laughs> well, to be frank, Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth mostly ignore me. Right. Uh, so, um, it's more uh, academics, uh, some academics, it, it's, it's their job, right? Um, some people are paid to uh, cause these problems. For an environmental organization to claim that a problem is small means that you lose influence and you lose donations and you lose members. So it is in their best interest to exaggerate the problem. And it's therefore also in their best interest to attack people who argue otherwise. Yeah, so it's all uh, par for the course, right? So let's look at the politics of it. Um, you know, the UK government, as you know, have set a target of net zero carbon by 2050. The EU has got a similar target. Others are saying that's uh, not ambitious enough. What's your, what, you know, if the government came to you and said, uh, Professor Toll, you know, we've got this target, how do we achieve it? What would you say to them in terms of policy? I would say forget about this target. When I said it's relatively easy, I did not mean uh, zero, uh, zero CO2 uh, by 2050. Um, the problem uh, with uh, energy use, 
from this perspective is that a lot of it depends on long-lived capital. So the average lifetime of a coal-fired power plant is 40, 60, 80 years. Um, the average lifetime of a gas-fired power plant is 40 years or so. Uh, the average lifetime of a car uh, is 20 years if you count the, the second-hand cars uh, that go to Turkey. And if you then start adding planning permissions and preparation time and everything, 2050 sounds far away. It's 30 years into the future. Uh, so that's at least six elections, right? Uh, so from a political perspective, this is like the distant future. Uh, but from an infrastructure perspective, some of the stuff that we are using now will still be there in 2050. And that means that a 20, zero, zero CO2 by 2050 is very, very ambitious. And we're most likely going to miss that. And, and one thing I forgot to mention uh, is that, of course, a lot of CO2 comes from buildings. Um, yes. And the building stock in Great Britain, uh, or actually on the British Isles, is pretty poor. Um, and you're not going to get there with sort of half measures. And it actually means that a lot of buildings will need to be torn down and rebuilt. That's the only way to get them to zero carbon. Um, so, no, this, this, is not, this is not going to happen. And in terms of, you know, when targets are set, sometimes targets are criticized for various reasons. Uh, two reasons I can think of. One is sometimes it detracts us from things that probably we should be doing. Um, I think you kind of alluded to that in some of your comments. And secondly, let us be aware of unintended consequences. Um, you know, for example, we know in the UK, uh, uh, when the government decided to uh, have the dash for diesel, um, uh, um, um, you know, we, we saw the unintended consequences of that, the sort of rise in particulates and other, uh, uh, other, mm -hmm. other pollutants. We saw the same thing with some of the sort of uh, fluorocarbons, um, encouraging more, more generation of that in order to um, apply for more money from the EU schemes. Um, what, what do you think we are detracting from in having these targets? And what are some of the unintended consequences that we might be setting ourselves up for? Well, un unintended consequences are sometimes hard to predict, right? And of course, sure. we, in, re in retrospect, uh, we know a number, of, you, you mentioned two. Um, another one was the early regulations in the EU ETA. Right, that invited uh, carousel fraud, for instance. The, 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 my, my main concern with uh, setting targets is that it's not about setting targets. What matters is the policies you deploy, not what you say you want to achieve. Uh, I can declare that I want to go to the Olympics in 2011 uh, in 2021, right? Yes. And that doesn't help, right? The only way to get there is to actually train hard. That is what gets you to the Olympics, not saying that you want to go there. Uh, or I may declare uh, that I want to lose weight or win the Nobel Prize or something like that. That doesn't help, right? What matters is that you work hard on getting where you want to go. And that is much more important than declaring where you want to go. Uh, and that is what we see a lot in environmental policy and in climate policy in particular, that the target replaces the policy. And a politician standing up and declaring a target, then everybody is happy and everybody applauds him or her, but then we don't follow up. Uh, that is the, 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 the big issue. Uh, in terms of unintended consequences of things perhaps that not everybody is looking at, is uh, I'm particularly worried about the um, the chemical waste that will come off the solar panels, right? Solar panels are perfectly fine as long as they're on your roof. Uh, but if you start taking them off, they become chemical waste. They're really full of very nasty uh, chemicals and heavy metals uh, and all those things. And we haven't really thought about what to do with that. Um, uh, so that is one thing that I think has been overlooked. Uh, the other problem that people haven't thought about when they're talking about net zero is what to do with agriculture. And at the moment, we 
just don't have a clue uh, really how to get rid of the methane uh, from uh, cows and particularly how to get rid of the methane from rice fields. Um, that is something that is completely underexplored. And if you want to go to zero emissions soon, uh, then you would need to have a technical solution there soon uh, because people will not go without their meat, without their milk, without their cheese, without their rice, right? These are fairly basic uh, staple goods. And at the moment, we simply don't know how to produce these things without uh, emitting a lot of methane. Most people you speak to, despite their politics, would probably say that they have some concern a bit about the environment. You know, some will recycle, some will say they want to live a, you know, a more environmentally friendly life. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily, that's necessarily a left-right thing in politics. But when you see a many, many of the people who campaigns, or so-called environmentalists, um, self-identified, they often say that climate change and the whole damage to the environment is a crisis of capitalism or it's a crisis of free markets. What, 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 what's your particular view on that, especially when you think about, uh, when you look at some of the statistics of the, about the sort of, um, the, sort of the, the, the most advanced economies, some of them have got a relatively better record at tackling some of the environmental problems? I know, you're, you're absolutely right there. The nature conservation movement actually comes out of fairly right-wing policies, but most of the environmental movement uh, is fairly left-wing. What people also overlook is that if you look at the two big success stories in greenhouse gas emission reduction over the last 50 years, they actually come from the right and not from the left. And the first success story, uh, and he will not be uh, pleased to hear this, uh, is of course the liberalization of the electricity market and the death for gas in the UK, followed by electricity market liberalization in the rest of the world. And it was of course Nigel Lawson who was behind this, but that is one of the key reasons why CO2 emissions from the UK are so low relative to other places, and actually Nigel Lawson, who is primarily responsible for that. And that was not driven by a concern for the environment, but was driven by uh, a love for the free market. Um, and similarly, the other main success story in greenhouse gas emission reduction is shale gas, uh, particularly in the United States, that has led to, uh, yeah, has led to a massive shift from coal-fired electricity to gas-fired electricity, uh, and therefore for a massive reduction uh, in CO2 emissions. And that, of course, has lastly happened under uh, Bush the Younger. Um, again, not somebody known for his love for the environment uh, and somebody who is associated with right-wing politics rather than left-wing politics. And I think it's very unfortunate that the environmental movement does not look at, so what worked in the past and what do we need to do in the future? And I mean, climate policy is about reforming the energy sector and the agricultural sector. And that means that you have to work with the people in that sector rather than against the people in that sector. And that is what they're doing. And that explains why after 35 years of trying, uh, climate policy has been so very in reducing emissions. And why do you think there is, you know, you said that nature conservation has come from the right, but a lot of environmental activists come from the left. Why do you think that is? Are they using environmentalism as a means to achieve their goals and more state control? Um, or is it, you know, I mean, I mean, is there some other reason? A, a lot of concern or expressed concern about the environment is really concern about something else. I think you're absolutely right there. There's a lot of people who jump on the climate bandwagon, not because they're interested in climate, but because it's the, uh, the hot thing to do at the moment. It's the best way uh, of attracting uh, attention. And I have a good few of them. Uh, and uh, people like Mary Robinson, doesn't know anything about climate, right? She doesn't care about this. If you listen closely to her speeches, if you read her words, 
if you talk to her personally, she is really a social activist. Same for somebody like Naomi Klein, right? If you read her books about climate, it's clear that she is not interested. She has no knowledge of the subject. And really, she does this because she wants to have this social anti-capitalist revolution. She is not interested in climate change whatsoever. There is no sign uh, of that in her writing. And there's a lot of people like that, less prominent uh, perhaps than these two. Um, but um, unfortunately, that's, that's, that's the case. Um, you're clearly in favor of carbon taxes, obviously if done correctly. One of the criticisms of carbon taxes is that quite often it's just used for governments to raise more revenue and voters and others don't really see the connection between the, between the, the tax itself, which is supposed to be a green tax or carbon tax, and um, a measures to, uh, you know, for, for a cleaner to address climate change. How do you think we have that, a much clearer link between carbon taxes and tackling some of the problems in the environment? Well, things have changed, right? Uh, what I would have said four weeks ago is that you actually should not talk about carbon taxes, uh, but what you should say in Europe uh, is that you're going to reduce labor taxes, um, wage taxes, employment taxes, all those things, um, payroll taxes, and in return, in order to finance that, we're going to put a small tax on energy. Uh, that is how I think a carbon tax should be presented, that you bring the, the good things first and then say, yeah, but in return, we have to pay more for energy, but you will take more of your salary home. Um, that is what I uh, would have said four weeks ago. Uh, one of the uh, sad things about uh, Corona is that we have a government that it will be hugely more in debt than we thought only four weeks ago. And therefore, at this particular venture, uh, raising taxes is actually a good thing because we will need to pay back all that money. Public finance economists will tell you that you're best off uh, raising taxes for on stuff that everybody uses right. and everybody uses energy. So the tax basis is broad and therefore you, that's where you should apply your tax um, and that you should uh, raise taxes that are relatively low rather than relatively high and our energy taxes or some of our energy taxes definitely our environmental taxes are still relatively low and therefore the dead weight loss of raising these taxes is smaller than the dead weight tax uh, dead weight loss of raising uh, taxes on labor uh, so that would be my argument at the moment the government needs this money and, and taxes will have to go up. And do you think that carbon taxes or you know what people call green taxes or whatever, do you think that they do fall disproportionately on the poor? And is there a way of avoiding that? And you know, do we, will we have when you think about, for example, the fuel, the escalator and the government's reluctance uh, to continue that or to reintroduce that? The problem is that they say, oh, this you know the problem with this is it falls disproportionately on the poor or on working people. How do we address that concern? No, that, that's uh, absolutely correct. Um, energy is a necessary good. That means in pre proportion to our income, poor people spend more on energy and food than rich people do. Um, and therefore, anything that raises the price of uh, energy or food uh, is a regressive tax. It falls disproportionately on poorer people. Um, the way to go about that uh, is that you should use some of the tax revenue to uh, increase tax credits, to increase benefits in order to compensate uh, for that. There's been a number of calculations across Europe uh, around this theme, and they all suggest that with about a third of the tax revenue, you can completely offset uh, the poorer half of the population. Um, so it's not it's not an insurmountable problem. It does require uh, political will and savviness, but it's not an insurmountable problem. So we've talked about poverty and potential, you know, the idea of fuel poverty in, in richer countries. What about uh, at a global level? What about this, the, this whole debate about poorer countries and how do you 
you know, make sure that they cut their carbon emissions and do their bit to contribute to the environment, given that they're actually trying to industrialise and they'll say, well, you guys went through it. It's not fair on us now. Well, uh, it's for them to decide uh, what they want to do, right? Uh, they're independent, sovereign countries, so we should not tell them what to do. Um, but of course, we can seduce them into doing things. And the solution there lies, and this is again a message that environmentalists do not want to hear, uh, lie in the free market, right? And lie in innovation. And I mean, people don't really care what they burn. What they care about is that it gives, brings heat and light and comfort. Um, uh, and uh, that you can transport things. So if you really want to solve the climate problem and if you really want to convince people in India and Nigeria and China to emit less CO2, then what you should do is offer them an energy source that is carbon free or carbon poor and is just as cheap and just as abundant and just as convenient as fossil fuels are. That is the technological challenge that we need to solve. And as soon as you offer that on the free market, they will take it up um, because they would prefer cheaper and cleaner energy over uh, dearer and dirtier, dirtier energy. Um, so that is where the solution lies. Uh, developing these uh, technologies uh, and as I said um, solar is already uh, or no sorry wind is already competitive in certain niche markets not everywhere but in certain niche markets wind already competes with coal and gas uh, solar already competes in very small niche markets with coal and gas and the challenge is to make those niches bigger and make solar attractive without subsidies um, or government regulation. Um, throughout um, the conversation today, you, we've talked a bit about quite a bit about technology. Do you think that we sometimes underestimate human ingenuity in discussions over tackling climate change? You know, should we put more faith in the, in the ingenuity of mankind, or is that you know, sort of a too abstract idea? Well. Well, if, if you phrase it like that, it's pretty abstract. Um, I, I mean, <laughs> people are pretty clever. Uh, and if put on the pressure, they come up with all sorts of uh, wonderful solutions to that. So, no, I, I, and if you just look at how much technological progress there has been over the last 200 years or so, um, I absolutely see no reason why we cannot solve this problem. Uh, at the same time, there is a lot of technology pessimism out there, particularly on the impacts of climate change, uh, is something that annoys me no end. Uh, particularly stories about sea level rise and how everybody's going to drown. And I mean, the Sumerians invented dikes, what is it, 5,000 years ago? The ancient Chinese invented dikes 5,000 years ago. And all of a sudden, if you believe your efforts, journalist writing about sea level rise, we have forgotten how to do this. And it's just this, it's just stupendously stupid that, that people think like that. And, and the same is true uh, for greenhouse gas emission reduction. Yes, there's all sorts of solutions out there uh, that we just need to embrace. And there again, the environmental movement um, may be part of the problem rather than part of the solution because I, I mentioned methane before some of that solution will come from genetic engineering and that seems to be both in terms of the supply of biofuels uh, but also and that's for CO2 uh, but also stuff like bringing barley genes into uh, rice plants so that they emit less methane the solution there lies in more technology, including stuff like genetic engineering that in a lot of environmental circles is uh, taboo. So look, um, Professor Tol Richard, oh, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Um, it's been thank hugely fascinating. Don't forget, you can subscribe to the IA podcast on Apple, Spotify and Podbean. And you'll also find some episodes on YouTube. Thank you for listening.